Today is May 21st, 1996. Our survivor is Walter Berger. I'm Lori Fine. We're in Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America. Our language is English. Today is May 21st, 1996. Our survivor is Walter Berger. I'm Lori Fine. We're in Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America, and our language is English. Hi, could you please tell us your name with the correct spelling? My name is Walter Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R. -E and Walter? Walter is a W-A-L-T-E-R. Do you have a Hebrew name? A Hebrew name is Zev, Z-E-V. Did you have a different name at birth? At birth, I was called Wolf, V-O-L-F. Were you ever known by any other names or nicknames? No. Could you tell us perhaps, your birth? Perhaps I was known as Vali. The V O L I. Could you tell us your birth date? Well, it's uh, January 30th, 1922. And how old are you now? I'm 74 on my last birthday. And could you tell us where you were born? I was born in the, it was then Czechoslovakia. The name of the town is Velky Rakovets, R-A-C-O-V-I-T-C, V-I-C rather, V-I-C. Could you tell us about the town? Well, it was a not too large a town. There was about 80 Jewish family, families, would have been perhaps about uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the general population. The town had a Shaykhet, a Dayan, who was the Shaykhet's father-in-law. We had one shul. Do you remember the rabbi? The, we had no rabbi. The, rab the Shaykhet, whose name was Isaac Frisch, he acted as the rabbi of the town of the village. We had one shul. What was the name? Did it have one? Has, it had no name because there was only one. Later on, they built on the same yard next to the shul, they built a cemetery. One of the reasons might have been in the winter time that shul had no heat. There was in the need there was one room that was heated so they built a Vesemedrish. They, I remember during my, I was a young boy then, they built it out of uh, mud, which straw, which came to mind like the Egyptians were building the bricks with pyramids. They took the mud at the ground from our garden, which was directly across the street. And then they had people that knew how to build it with straw, to get it dried up on the sun, and they, that's how they built it. That Vesemedrish consisted of a Vesemedrish, a Vibeshul, a uh, small room there, like to get together. And that was about, well, because the big shoe was on cement, there was wooden floors, and it had heating, which it had a belly stove. The shoe was a Strictly orthodox school with a balcony. The women never they didn't go there to school, only on the high holidays, and what, or only during the summer, because in the winter time there was hardly in the school where for them to come in. And uh, that was about the uh, the school. We had a regular building for the Czech school. And then they also, we had a big house. Could you tell me about your house? We had a very big house with many rooms. We had a, uh, one of the rooms we used as a uh, classroom for the Czech school. Uh, one, the of the rooms had, in your, one of the rooms in your house was, was used for the Czech school? Was used as a Czech school, as a classroom. We had a, was a huge yard in front of the house. And uh, since I had sisters, as I suppose later in the program we'll find out, 
and they were very fond of flowers, so they made very nice pockets of flowers there. At the end of it, there were huge trees at the sidewalk. It was not a paved sidewalk. It was just something put together, raised from the street, with some protection or it shouldn't wash away. So, uh, and then to the side of it, it had a uh, stable. In the stable, there was always a cow for milk. Next to it, there was a, some chicken coops, strictly for our own, for the, our own use. You had some geese and some ducks and chickens. And actually, it was a huge garden of fruit. We had all, all type of fruits growing there. We had next to the house one of the most famous wells that during the summer uh, people who had the deep wells that they had to bring up the water, they used to run dry. Our well, which was just to bend down and scoop up the water, never went dry. It was always cold. As a matter of fact, the runoff from it used to be, to go through a little garden, a vegetable garden, but it was always kept damp. Like in the summertime, they had enough water there to go in and wash up because uh, the mikva that we had, there was one mikva which was only heated for Shabbos. Otherwise, we bathed at home or at the river or whatever. And uh, we had a cheder. Do you remember the exact address of your house? Well, to the best of my recollection, they had a house number of 362. And I believe that there was no street names because the houses, we happened to look like partly would be called the Main Street. So therefore, there were more than a row. Otherwise, it would have been a house with a garden around it, uh, with some, you know, uh, yard, huge yards. And it was never built. Uh, uniformly or anything like that. Uh, what else can I tell you? It was a lively town. What sort of business was in the town? In the well, the population was mostly. Some of them were laborers, whether they worked in town for on the fields, or they went into the cities to uh, be laborers. The Jewish people, most of the stores, grocery stores, which were, there were maybe three or four of them, they all belonged to Jewish families until the war, anyway. And uh, the heating, the heating was done, for instance, there was by wood, wood stoves or uh, wood stoves. So we used to, when the, the, the population, those people that didn't have other jobs, used to chop woods or prepare for the winter time because we had quite severe winters there. On Hanukkah, it was a pretty good bed to where there will be snow. The snow used to get so caked up that a horse was able to walk on it and not fall in. And it didn't melt until before... Uh, Poor Pesach. Until then, it was usually wagons were put aside and mostly used sleds, which uh, throughout the winter. The, uh, and uh, what uh, my parents, my father, was one of the, my grandfather, I believe, was born in town, in that same town. What was your grandfather's name? Uh, his name was Mayer. Or Mayor the, the Rakovitz, as they called him, because of the name of the town, because he was a known personality. As a matter of fact, he lived with us, and I will never forget that my mother the 
When he got old, he lived with us. <coughs> My, many times, we, the children, had to help our mother to lift him up, to make him comfortable. Because there, there were no old age homes. Nobody gave away their parents. He finally died on a Saturday morning, Friday night, in his bed in 1932. But they, he asked for a piece of holly and some wine, and that's how he died. Uh, a matter of fact, what comes to mind, when he was an old man, I was a, a little boy, and he was planting trees. So an old peasant walks by and he says to him, in the language that he spoke, Ruthenian, says to Maya, You'll never live to see fruits of those trees no more, at your age. So he says to him, listen, I got children, I got grandchildren. And they will. And those three trees that he planted, he gave every year so much fruit. That's unbelievable. Uh, you know, these things that come to mind while talking about Life was good. We lived a good life. We weren't the richest people in town, but we were far from being the poorest. Most Jewish people were comfortable and, uh, and uh, made a living one way or another. Could you tell me about your parents? Let's start with your father. My father was very active in politics. As a matter of fact, he was like... Uh, uh, on the committees of the uh, uh, whatever the town needed. He was very much in for education. He was himself very much educated. He went to, he was uh, I-9 sick. He was the only one in his family, and they were well to do then. He went to Yeshiva in, in Oberland, that the that Slovakia. And uh, we, uh, he did all type of it, whether it was the season from fruits and the season when it was from um, corn or wheat or whatever came about. He was dealing with those things. And uh, then actually married my mother who was from what the next town. What was your father's first name? Gide Hersch. Hersch Hermann. Everybody knew him as Gide Hersch. When you think Good back thing. to your father, what one thought comes to mind? Well, one of the thoughts that comes to mind is his, his education, his intelligence. And, uh, and the respect that he was given by the population. Those things come very much to, to mind and always education, education, and more education. And your mother's name? My mother's name was Helen Henche. She was from the neighboring town, but about five kilometers away from us. What was her maiden then name? Her maiden name was Hollander. They knew her as the Henche the Hollander Kurs Tochter from Bilka. It was, we had a, as I said, a big house and since she came from the neighboring town. So all the relatives, cousins, and so on every Shabbos, or especially Yontif, they used to come to, uh, and then there always, there was always an open house. All the kids used to get together by all their friends used to get together. Everybody had a room in our house. And many a time they slept over that just out, it used to be in the summertime. They used to put out uh, blankets on the porch and they used to sleep there. And uh, that's what, how we were. What special memory do you have of your mother? Her beauty. Her kindness. My father was strict. 
My mother was very lenient with us. And uh, and the hard way she had to do, raising eight children. They had no washing machines. They had no refrigerators. If to preserve some food for Shabbos, we had a cellar under the door, under the up under the house. There was a cellar, and that kept cool some items like when we left from overnight or over for Shabbos. The one thing that she never was all children had to do their chores. There was no exceptions, boys or girls. There was a question to polish the shoes before Shabbos or to clean the candle the candlesticks. For Shabbos the lighter or whatever way, there was no difference between the boys and the girls. In the washing dishes, the boys just like the girls. Because there were three boys and five girls. Could you tell me about your brothers and sisters? Well, my older sister was a teacher. Her name? Her name was Rose, Rosa. She was, as I said, a teacher. Uh, not far away, she used to have a bicycle and travel there by bike. My second sister, is, uh, her name is, uh, they called her Gizzy, Gizzefeige. She was working, uh, she also got a fine education, and she was working in a, uh, like it would be a city hall, but comparable to that. My, the next one in line was my brother, his name is Sam. Shmuel. He went to school, he was still in school in uh, Brun, that's in Moravia, and the Hebrew Academy there, the Hebrew Gymnasium. My next one's name is Olga. She, uh, she was still in school, and she was the one when had said in the rough times that she was mostly helper to my mother. And I was next. I was after I finished the school and the Hungarians came in, they took over the country. What was your education like until that point? Uh, my education? My education was, uh, as I went to a, a high school, it's called Nyashchanka. Uh, by the name that was in Bilka. As I mentioned before, my mother comes from there, it's about five kilometers. We used to walk there morning and night, back and forth, rain or shine. Whereas one was kidding, you know, not everybody says, the, but what do you do with the water when the water melts, the snow melts? He said, well, it's one good thing, the water goes out the same way it comes in. It wasn't easy, but there were also other children from the town that went there, so we used to walk in a group. Like in the winter night, we used to start out early. It was still dark. I go back to where I was young, but then I went to Haider in town. And so like we used to get up at, uh, we used to get up like at five in the morning and learn until 8, 8 o'clock, 8.30, school started, regular public school. So that was until 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock we rushed home, ate something, and went back to school until it was time to dump, Menachem Meyerov. Where would you run back? Which school? Back home. We would go back home. From and the, then? The, then we would go from school. Till 3 o'clock we were in school. 3 o'clock we would go home and, and grab a fast bite and go back to Haider. And Haider, <coughs> we would usually stay till about 8 o'clock. And that's when we went home for dinner, for supper. Rain or shine. Many times we walked to Haider before anybody 
whatever seen in, in knee high or uh, uh, belt high snow uh, fell in over the night. So we just was like the first ones to to find our way. Did you have any friends at that time? Yes. Do you remember any of their names? Sure. One of my closest friends was Hershey, they called him, Norman Hersh. Khan. We played, we had problems. We were, you know, in a town, so we had, where they left chopping wood. So I was chopping wood once, and he says, no, he wants to chop, and I says, no, it's mine. So I want to chop, and boys would do. And the, uh, the hug, the uh, thing, to cut wood, but saw. Not the lock, the uh, hatchet. Oh. Hatchet fell off, and it cut his foot right on top of the. He went home. It was under. He was. He lived between the Besamedrish and us. He went into Besamedrish. It was open. Naturally, there we kept that open all day. He bandaged it up. He went home. He never told his mother he was a, his father was not alive. He never told his mother what happened. I was afraid to go and visit him as a, and uh, so he was like one of my closest friends. Then I have one, Avner. But usually those that we went, uh, same age, we went to Haider together, to school together, so we, are, we were friends. Did you have any free time to spend with your friends? The free time was like Shabbos. What did you do? Well, we would uh, uh, we would get together and play games, build a swing or something, or play tag, or uh, as children would play that they did at home too. I recall going home from Haider once. I was sort of bigger than my friends. And uh, so, uh, as boys would fight occasionally, and we were fighting, and I was able to beat up any one of them. But then they gagged up on me, about three of them, and uh, they chased me through the snow. And I suppose I got a cold or what, that it got me off my feet for about six weeks, that I lost my sight completely. Never told my parents what happened, but it came back about uh, like about after four, after six weeks, I believe. But that same friend had she went out to the. There was no one left in his family, no survivors. He he did survive, the first day in Israel, he got killed. As a matter of fact, when I went to Israel, I was able to to go to a different cemetery, except it. So, well, that's what it is. So those are my friends. One of them that did survive and wound up in Israel, he he was working as a bookkeeper for Agat, Agat Boss Company. He's all right. I see him occasionally. I haven't spoken in the last two years. I hope he's still all right. And that's about... Uh, then I had another friend who, again, I saw him get killed, tragically. Shot by the Nazis. Not even the Nazis, but the Hungarian... Uh, Nilos, uh, as they call him, that his brain splashed on me. Those are about, about my closest friends that I would say in town. You mentioned one grandparent before. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember any of the others? I that you do remember, we had a grandmother, Her my mother's mother, 
and she uh, lived to be in her 80s. Her name? Uh, her name was Rivka Hollander, and she wound up in Auschwitz. So, uh, naturally, what I remember about her, that uh, while I went to school there, if, uh, sometimes I stayed over, I went to grandma for cookies and milk or so. Did you have any skill or training for job before the war? None at all. What were you prepared to do? Just, I suppose, follow the business or get some more education and then see where I go from there. But I had no set uh, thing in mind of what I would like to be or what I want to be until I picked up the trade when I... Yes, they did prepare us. No, uh, during the Hungarian regime, when I got bigger, there was the art organization, and they were in the city. They were not in our town. They were in the say, in the city that was Sevilla, Sevilla. Was this near your area? Uh, it's about twenty kilometers from us, and they had opened there a basket weaving people to learn other trades they were teaching uh, to prepare ourselves for the a matter of fact later in life that came very handy what I have learned there which I suppose we will talk about uh, otherwise there was no when when I finally became a young man of age to think about something there was I had to be home my father couldn't get around he had a small beard he had a beard We were not fanatic. We were a modern Jewish family. And he was unable during the Hungarian regime, uh, he was very noticeable because of the beard. So whatever traveling there was to be done, it was up to me because my brother wasn't home, my big brother. Yes, I'm talking about Big Brother. I forgot the when you asked me about my sibling, my sisters, and my brothers. I forgot to mention my younger brother that was in line. I got carried away. Another who was four years younger than, and he was killed on a march two days before liberation. What was his name? His name was Moshe. And. Uh, <laughs> So we were, we were, what were they how, speaking about? How would you describe yourself as a young person? As a young person, I was kind of very alert. I would always consider myself being alert. I always consider myself being an understanding of people. I, we were very much taught of respect. It was one of the things that our parents instilled in us, respect. Uh, excuse me. As young boys, because we had an old Malamut, Reb Zalman, and in the winter time, on Shabbos, the steps were go down from the cemetery. There was a few steps to go down, and I ran in front of him, and my father saw me. After he saw me, I got a punishment. My punishment was he lived quite almost the end of the town. I had to walk him home very often after that for just for doing so we were we were taught respect this is tape two our survivors walter berger and today is may 21st 1996. could you tell us about shabbos in your home yes shabbos was one of the happy days the entire family was together we managed during the week to eat together but shabbos was a must there was always those fresh Hollies baked in the morning. There was always happy. We sang a lot of mirrors. Do you remember any of them? Uh, remember a lot, and I still do one with the children. Could you sing one? Uh, well, we had uh, we sang with the same tune, uh, like we were singing. Uh, let's see, which one would it be? Uh, 
So on and others, and also others that uh, we, my father, may have to be other children you would have been running around already and playing, but we had to stay until we sang as mirrors and we benched, and that's when it was time for us to get up and rest. Shabbat was the day for rest first. Then we used to go for a walk. We had a garden away from home, so we used to take the whole family or leave the smaller children and go for a walk with the parents. Yontif, that was uh, Shabbos. In the evening, Shabbos evening, they always had a shalashudas, a besavadr. They had no electric lights. So it was just in the dark, actually, until finally to Dab Mairov, they used to put in a candle, a couple of candles. Since there was no central heating, no central running water, no uh, light, so... And Yontov was about the same thing. Every Yontov was just a... most festive. What was Pesach like? Pesach... The excitement was started on Purim, before Purim, for the reason that since we had a mill, so we used to kasher it for, to make the matzah meal. So then the, most people were busy, the women, they would put on the table, a white tablecloth, and take the wheat and put it up there, and then just keep moving it over whether there wasn't a foreign object in there. That's how particular they were. Then everybody would bring their own package to the mill, which it was kasher tampurim. Then came the active rabbi, the shaykhet, and he used to check it. I used to burn some straw on there, and then get them some um, uh, corn through it, and then some, and then first we had somebody sleep there day and night while that was going. They would never remove the the flour while it was raining or it was too ma too too many waters in the street. And then actually they were busy baking, uh, taking uh, water for uh, uh, for the matzahs. So used to take it the day before the store. And the women used to come and vulgar the matzahs. And the boys were busy radling and carrying it. And uh, there was a lot of excitement. And every, because everybody had their own. There were no factories to bake them. You baked them yourself. It was all done by several. There was a guy who was strong enough to keep making the... They would watch the clock, and everything was done to the utmost. That was Pesach. Shavuos came along, there was excitement with flowers, with decoration, but uh, uh, there wasn't a house that didn't go through the same uh, procedure as the other one. Uh, if it, uh, it came to Shavuos, the children used to go into the, uh, outside the town, they used to pick berries on that day. Uh, that was anticipable. Uh, after that uh, comes uh, uh, when it came Slichas Zeit. On Slichas Zeit, we used to get at the Shama, we used to go early in the morning, like four in the morning, and I can do it. to Slichas. Get up for Slichas, it's time to. So the older folk used to go to the Mikva and the cold Mikva before Slichas. The boys used to have a lot of fun running around. There was a a neighbor who had a tree over it, he was to knock down the knots or whatnot. So there was a lot of excitement. Rosh Hashanah, well, actually, that was one of the quietest human time. The women would get dressed in white. Most people would would, uh, would wear a kittle. If not that, then a Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, we used to have, uh, and again, we had no electricity, so we used to take melons. It's not a watermelon, it's a melon, the size of a watermelon. Cut it in half, dig a hole in the center, and put in one of the candles. They used to buy it like 24 hours. So those things, they used, and since it was stone floor, so they used to take straw, which they took from our house, since we were right directly across the street. And uh, because nobody wore shoes, they all made, either they had homemade slippers, or they walked around in socks. Onion kipper. I am Kipper. Sukkot, every house had a sukkah near the house. The excitement started uh, Matzah Yom Kippur. Right after Yom Kippur, 
you could hear people starting to build the sukkah at least to put in one piece of them. There were no prefabricated ones. It was all done from scratch. Ours was a more modern house, so we had one that was built because we had to uncover the roof. We used it for the roof otherwise. But in most cases it was built from scratch with material from the farm, from the garden. And so every yonta was a happy occasion. The youngsters used to get together, walk to the other town, meet with other youngsters that we knew. Uh, uh, and that was about... Uh, Did you belong to any youth groups or clubs? We had the... Uh, before the war, just after the war, after just before Hitler came out, rather, there was the organization Batar. The, uh, they started to organize. And they came around in every town and village. So, same thing did with us. They sent around people who spoke about the, about Israel, about Palestine. And uh, in order to make it more enticing, we used to run ball games. So when we, we were not far from a city called Mukachevo, Minkach. There was a rabbi. That. Every time I speak about him, my blood boils, because he sent that out messengers to all these town and villages to speak against uh, the organization or against uh, being organized for uh, or against playing ball, especially. So at Shilashuri, there would always would be the discussion among the elders. Then they came home and said, "Did you were you also at that meeting? Did you also play?" Uh, you know, they used to get us together, they used to play games with us, play ball, and play just to get organized. And some people that were older did take the advice of these advisors, and they did run away from home, and did run away from Hitler, and did survive. However, that was about, uh, but uh, or in the summertime, during the week, we used to go swimming to the lake, to the river. Do you remember what languages were spoken in your home? In our home, we spoke Yiddish. Do you remember having newspapers or? We had not a town paper. We had a uh, we had a paper that came from the city. It was mostly Czech, which we got the education in Czech. My parents, since they were born while it was Austro-Hungary, so they spoke Hungarian, especially my father. And so he spoke both languages, and he would get one of the papers, one of the, or the other, and read them. How did you get news? The news we get word to mouth. Usually in the, somebody came from the city, and the mikveh, Friday, Mittuk, and they were telling about the news. When did you become aware of the uh, uprising, or not uprising, the change in politics and the rise of the Nazis? Well, we got, when they came in, Hungary, the Hungarians, when they came in to occupy us in 1939, I believe, uh, we did not see any Germans. We did not know exactly the connection. They kept it so much a secret from us, and they managed to do that, that we didn't know. All we know that the Shaykh that I mentioned, Mr. Fifth, he was not a Czech citizen. He was not born there. He was from Poland. So he was taken away like one of the first ones out of the town. And then somebody saw him being thrown in in Poland to one of the rivers, tied hands and feet, and the Dnieper or Dniester river, they saw him floating there with uh, barbed wire tied. Uh. So that was rumors that we heard, but to see actually or to get on the news or get a paper which would uh, really spell it out or tell you what it is, it was all rumors and uh, were difficult to substantiate them or difficult to believe them and so on. And uh, then when uh, then it came, they took me away. Who did this? The Hungarians. What they did is they organized the young boys, the Jewish boys. We had to go around and clean around the schools or the streets. And... Uh, uh, and then we were a, they gave us a yellow band by then. And they uh, they marched us like so we had to get together and then they took us in a group. What was on the arm band? Nothing, just yellow. Nothing on there. Did you have a star? Uh, no star on it. 
Later on, I understand, they, but uh, I wasn't around then when they already ordered the stars. Because at the age of 22, they took me to uh, uh, forced labor. When was this? That was uh, the summer. They came in like in the spring. Let's see, they came in in 39. So we lived, uh, I personally lived under the Hungarian regime for about, uh, uh, till they took me away in 42. What was it like from 39 till 42? 39, 42 is very difficult for a Jew. It was, it was very dangerous. They were trying to suppress as far as uh, having kosher meat as far as kosher slaughtering. I recall an incident where we, uh, we used to manage to get either a uh, lamb or a uh, calf and have it uh, slaughtered and then we would split it up. And uh, there was one time that I was bringing some of it to my family in Bilka, where my grandmother lives, and I was caught with the bicycle bringing the meat and they wanted to know where, what it is, where I got it and what happened. They just wanted to know who slaughtered it. I said, I did it myself because the guy would have been in real trouble for doing that. I said, I <laughs> made up a story that I saw the calf dying, so I figured before it dies, I'll, uh, I'll just took a knife and cut the throat. I said, there's nothing to it, which was far from the truth. And I was beat up then at the police station, and that was, and the lieutenant, the one that was in charge, the captain of the prison, he used to get the bottom part of the calf he used to get a good portion of it because of it was not kosher, it was only the front. Yet I got so, but they didn't lock me up. They let me out, it was on Friday, they let me out before Shabbos. And after that I went to court, to the city. And then they gave me, they gave me jail. The jail was, so I got friendly with the jailer. It wasn't a jail where there were any criminals, any hard criminals. And I promised him, since I live in town, I'll bring him some fruit, and I'll bring him some uh, for his chickens there, but he had them, because I was ashamed to go and sweep the streets in the city there, or wash them. So, and he, so he would let me leave in the, in the evening, but I had to promise him way back in the morning. So I, it wasn't that bad, but it was tough to get anything. My, the, I had to do work that that my father would uh, have to do in business. I, one incident that I could recall, I went to pick up with a couple of wagons uh, in another city, another town, some corn, and they came over to confiscate it, and they looked at who was the one. Happened to be on a balcony, on a roof, rather, on an attic. And as I saw the Hungarian Soldier, uh, the police, they wore hard hats with feathers, big feathers, and there all of a sudden I see that I see the feathers, he's looking up. But when I was hiding under there, they didn't catch me, but they take away, they took away whatever. So whatever business we did, we had to do it with a guy being in the forefront. Did any guy or non-Jews help you? Uh, well, in business, he was a partner. We made the guy a partner. This was by choice, business. or you had to? No, we had to. In order to be able to do business, we had to uh, have a guy as a partner or, 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 or in his name to business. The population itself, the guy themselves, were not bad people. The problem was when they started to take the Jews, then they started to tell them you're going to take their property, you're going to get this garden, you're going to get this property, so they started to like it, the idea of it. And uh, a little bit of that where they started hating the Jews, hating them because if they wouldn't have been there, they, that would have, if, if they'll take them away, they will take all that will, will belong to them. As parents, they were hidden. They were hiding out when it came around pace of time. I wasn't home anymore. They came, since we knew the politicians, so we were tipped off, my family rather, was tipped off that they bringing in all the Jews to the, the gathering. 
What did you think that meant? Well, I wasn't home then. They knew that they'd take him away. When they took me, it was a question they don't trust Jewish boys, but uh, the goyim go to the army and we will go to forced labor. But when they took the parents, I don't know what explanation it was, it just uh, presumably that uh, the Russian front is getting too close and they don't trust the Jews to be there. So therefore my parents ran away and they were hiding out with my sisters for about six weeks. Where was this? They were in the uh, in our town, in the woods, in the uh, forest, by uh, Goyim that we know, that we knew, their parents knew and trusted them, until the priest uh, kept making announcements that anybody is called harboring a Jew or hiding a Jew will be shot to death. How did you know about these announcements? Well, they know because when the guy came, when I was told by my sisters after the war, because the guy came home, he says, listen, I was hiding you till now, but now I cannot any further. And then somebody ran and squealed at them and they came in. And they picked him up about two days before they vacated the ghetto in Barracks at Berhauer. That was the city where they gathered the Jews from our area. So they took him to Auschwitz. That was my parents. Uh, two of my, three of my sisters, and my brother, one brother, the youngest. My sisters, they got survived. My parents never did, and my younger brother was killed in a march. As a matter of fact, today it's three days and seven is their your side, which happens to be today. It's been a long time when I was here, if I saw a tall Jew, skinny, with a beard, I'd look twice. Maybe. But it wasn't. It was a question that you lived with a hope, knowing that in another life, because my sisters were there when they were taken. Yet, anybody that, <laughs> you could imagine that maybe action. So you looked twice, which was against any and all art. But that was the fact. And uh, after the war. What happened to you with, with this forced labor battalion? Well, we were, we were all marched into a city, rather, town in Slovakia. I don't remember the name of it. Who were you so with? I was just with uh, another boy, uh, Hamwolf, from our town. And we were sent there. And from there we went to a city in Hungary itself, because that was like in Slovakia and Hungary around the border. The best. It must have been around the holidays, around the human room, around the high holidays, because I knew Kipper, called a Night. I remember we were one of the cattle cars shipped to that Hungarian city which is called Holmeve Vasarhe. And there were some boys that remember some of the twill of some of the uh, passages or some of the uh, prayers of Kolnedra. Then we got there, when we got there, there where we were staying outside the city, there was like barracks there, I don't know whether they had an army there or whatever. And there they divided us up into sections. Like every group, they put 220 guys together and that constituted a unit. Do you remember if you had a number or some sort of designation? Yeah, had, they called it in Hungarian, per harum, five by two. They identified it as... Uh, like the, like they have five by three, five by uh, different ones. We were, my unit was called five by two. While we were there, there were still some non-Jews, some uh, rather Jews with, I mean, boys with white armbands. White armbands means, means a half a Jew. 
but then I don't know what happened to them. But what they did for fun, because they had nothing to do there in that city where they gathered us, so they used to take us to the railroad and make us take off our shirts and uh, just to introduce us to what we were going to be up to. So we had to make somersaults on the, on the track. And the, between the track there is, it's not pebbles like you call it here, pebbles that's mostly sand. There were pebbles that consisted of uh, uh, rocks that were broken up into small pieces and they were sharp. So we used to come home with bloody uh, uh, bags and that was just because that officer wanted to have fun that day. So that's what they would do. What were uh, the conditions like in this camp? In there, food wasn't too bad yet as then. I wouldn't say it was, it was that bad. I don't remember being hungry there. What about the conditions, general The, the conditions? conditions was we were sleeping practically on the outside. We didn't matter much. We were young. We were still full of energy. And what, from there... What sort of conversations would you have with your friends, people you were with? Well, we talk about our past. We talk about people. We uh, talk about the families or what we left behind. Did you have any idea what was happening at home? None at all. Did you have any idea what was happening in the rest of the world? None at all. None at all. You were not to pick up any paper. You were not to uh, listen to any radio. You are not to do anything. You are not to know what's happening. From there, then they send the 220 of us down to Serbia, Yugoslavia. There, we were working for the Hungarian army. Our job was there to dig ditches. Ditches were and bunkers, which means where they would run out and they were about waist high, deep. And since it was sand, because it was along the, alongside the river there, the Tisa, so that's when it came handy what Ort taught me as a kid to, uh, uh, to make these fences. And anything you knew how to do there, you became, they look up that, oh, this is a, this is a Jew that uh, didn't sit uh, behind the desk or uh, whatnot. He knows how to work. And it was a big plus. What skill was this exactly? Well, it was like weaving baskets. Like weaving, you know, you put in somewhere and then you uh, bring in some uh, uh, branches and you put it in uh, between the, uh, in order to retain the sand from it to, to cave in. So we were there for quite a while. Uh, if anybody had in mind to run away there, was again the problem which we have found out, you have to know who you belong to because there was always a danger whether you pro-Nazi, against Nazi, whether a communist. There are three parties and it's going on right now in, uh, in that part of the world. So you have to know the right gang that you meet up with, and otherwise you're dead. So naturally you thought twice and nobody dared to run away because we were still out more or less working. And you came home, you got food. From there, they took us to all the way at the end of the Carpathian, right by the border with Poland. How did you get there? Uh, by train, uh, cattle cars, mostly what the, cattle cars. What were the conditions like? Uh, the condition was they, they took along some food. They, uh, that wherever they stopped, they would have these con co uh, coffee uh, conservatives, dried up coffee with sugar, like one of these cubes would make up, I don't know how many. So we ate more or less. Then we got there to the city, and that's when we heard that, that was the time when they were taking away the Jew. Then we heard that. How did you find the south? Well, we found it out because we were in town that there were Jews. The Jews were still there. Yasin <coughs> was the name of the, of the village of town. And we were working there for the Hungarians, putting in, there were uh, the very tall mountains. And we had to dig 
into the rock, into the rock, about six and a half meters deep, because they figure they're going to dig that and put in their uh, explosives. So when the Russians will come, when they be there, uh, they be caught, nowhere to go, they'll blow them up. So we did that work. Now, coming from a town, I was better used to work, because when the Hungarians came in and the Goim didn't want to work for the Jews, we got together, boys, and we showed them, you know, how to farm and know how to do things. So one day, they promised that they're going to let us on, uh, on a furlough, which not, nothing happened. So I went in with about five other boys, and we stayed there in a peasant's house. It was a Shabbos. And there came the uh, Hungarians, and they arrested us. Any reason? The reason is we didn't go out to work that Shabbos afternoon. Why didn't we go to work? Because we didn't want in there, we stayed in a room. It wasn't a jail, it was a room that they took away one of, from one of the Jewish families. The guy was a shoemaker. And so they put us in there, they put straw on the floor, and that's where we slept. And Sunday, they, they brought us, they lined us up and to tell, give us our story. When he comes in front of me, the officer, he says to me, and what is your excuse? I says, so I motioned that I don't know what he's talking about because it was a short while after and I didn't speak another word of their language of Hungarian. So he got himself all excited and hollered out he was about 28 years old. They usually walked around with t boots. They were always, always shining. And he comes around and starts hollering, what kind of person are you? You don't even speak Hungarian. I didn't know what he said, but I asked one of the other guys, I says, what was he so excited about? So he told, finally we got a punishment that would tie our hands and bend the back of us, sort of like this, elbow to elbow, the, uh, and string us up to hang for two hours. That was the punishment without reaching the floor. Well, they did that to us in a woodshed. Okay. And the woodshed, when I came in there, I sized up the, where they have the ropes hanging. So I figured, well, I'll go to the very end, where it's the lowest. I was tall, and that's the lowest. And as they were talking, so I got some rocks and put under my heels, like, so it should. We also used that, the shed was also used as the kitchen. And he stayed there with a cigarette, with a cigarette holder. And there was one of the guys that was from Hungary, a Jewish guy also. But he was from real Hungary. And he was cursing, and, and Hungarian, they got an awful lot of questions about a mother. And anything he could think of, he would throw at them. And this guy says, pull him up higher. So he did not reach exactly. And as he's right, he goes over and gives him a, a fist into the ribs and the guy uh, starts his mouth started coming out the uh, same and this is tape three. Today is May twenty first, nineteen ninety six, our survivors Walter Berger. That. The so I was hanging there naturally we had a doctor that was present. He was also one of us. He was a Older guy, older which I, we were in the early 20s, and he was in his 30s, so we consider him the older man. And I told him, he says, I says to him, I'm hiding so much. He says to me, what are you hiding? I says, just that I have to go through this. What hurt you? I said, everything. So when he, when the officer heard me, everybody was crafting because it hurt. And now that I had it all that good, I, it paid, but not as much as the others, probably, because I, will, I, I managed to put some under my heel. So he hollered out again, he says, that I shouldn't complain, because if I'll complain, he'll, he really, he'll uh, pull me up higher. Who was this who said the this? The officer. Do you remember his name? Uh, he was the Zaslosh, I don't remember his name. He was a guy 
that was we had an old man who was in command but the old man left everything to this young fella he was uh, like I said before 28 years old and then he says to me he said there's a package for you my family before leaving they sent me a package and I had to sign for it. I says I cannot sign. My hand was numb. I was completely numb. As a matter of fact, I couldn't even carry out the package. There was some baked goods. So I asked them to send one of the other boys to get it for me. So he says, okay, I'll sign it for you. And then he got, he got to like me because he needed me as an interpreter when we got in because we were right near Poland and we were about to go in there. So he makes a statement, he says, if there will be any furloughs given, not that I think there'll be any, that uh, Berger will be the first one he wanted to to make up what he did. In Houston, so we stayed there and there was also a division of uh, the column and Hungarian Hatar Wadas, they were watching the border, they were border soldiers. And they were on skis and they were on, you know, because it was a mountainous area. And they used to also have fun at our expense. They went out and they caught every Jew, they pulled them in and beat the living relics out of him. That was their fun. If you stayed home sick, this guy said, after three days I have to send you to their doctor. Their doctor got you well because he beat you up. So this doctor, our doctor, was good enough to me that he put me, we also worked in a... Uh, where they were making lumber, cutting lumber, uh, anyway, can't think of the name of it in English. Anyway, they were making the heavy uh, logs of wood and then slicing them up, sort of. So he, I was able to take it easy after that. But then came a time when the Russians were pushing the Germans and the Hungarians back. They were gaining on them and it was going up the hill, so these high ranking officers with the fancy medals with the long coats, the Germans, and I guess this one says, turn over, just truck out of the way, you cannot drive up, and this one says, I said, we'll oblige, we'll turn them all over. So, but as they started getting reinforcements, we were there the first ones out, so when they, they burned their bridges, after they left, they threw down every bridge. We were there and we had to replace them. We had how, to wake them. How did you do this? Well, we, they had, the, they had uh, engineers there, but until we did that, so it was not that big of a river, so what we used to have, the wagon was going, so we would have to hold it back when it was going down and push it for the horses up, because they couldn't make it up until they built the bridge. Do you remember the name of the river? No, there were small local uh, uh, runoffs, like. They weren't too deep, like it would be a river river. We went that way, all the way to uh, Poland, all the way to Kolomei. Right under Kolomei, and there we run in, we find our, the first soldiers that were beating us up at Yasin, we find them. They says, oh dear children, you don't know what happened to us. I said, see, what happened to you? He said, there isn't a trade of us left. We held up on the Russian army, and they killed us. So I asked them the, uh, peasants. I was able to talk to them. I said, tell me, what happened? Where is the army? Where is the Russian army? He says, they were never here. It was partisans in the mountains. They were shooting at them, and there was such a fear, they put it to the Germans, and then they were tripping one over the others and running back. And it was going back then so easy that they got all the way, almost to Kolomei, which is about 85 kilometers from the Czech border. Who was in charge of you? Of all was in charge, the Hungarian uh, officers. We had Hungarian officers and then we had uh, uh, misfits, which I called them. They were not qualified, not good enough for the army, so they were our guards. They were the most ignorant guys that you want to meet. They were strictly, one of them was a gypsy, one of them was about this tall, and they were our immediate, uh, so when I befriended that officer and he went away on vacation, so the second in command after him 
by then I already managed to get to become a driver. How did with you horses, do that? Because he liked me. And I was from a town, don't forget in a town, townspeople knew how to handle horses too. So I was his driver. But when he went away, he had another boy that he wanted him to be. So he came once and got the horse, put on white gloves, and put on, you know that horse isn't clean. You finish with the horses. So uh, he gave me a punishment for that. They would put a stick under my, tie my hands in front of me, and then lower them enough that they put a stick under my knees. That was another one of these punishments where they dished out. And you had to stay like that again a couple hours. But uh, once the officer, my officer, the chief came back, so, so out of that place, while he was there, I had no more clothes. My clothes were all ripped. First of all, from there they picked a group of us to go to Budapest to pick up some clothes. Budapest, the capital of Hungary. There were about eight or ten of us. So since my officer wanted me to go, so I was one of them. That was clothes that the Joint Distribution Committee, American. How did you travel? By train. Regular car. Regular passenger train. And we picked that up. And then while he was away, he sent me away from the group in order I shouldn't be there. So, lucky for me, I never, I was told, don't never volunteer. They sent me a place, there were, I think, ten of us. They, in a group, to send to go to these the soldiers to help them carry, to bring their ammunition up to the mountains because the horses cannot go there. So we should carry it, as at least my law would have it. That group was then on uh, an arrest. Those soldiers that were supposed to use that ammunition were then arresting. And that was in Chernobyl. That was near Romania, because by the border there. Every day they would drive by the, of the army and give us rationing, something to eat, which I, in return, since I spoke to them, was able to exchange it for better things in town. And all day we spent going to Jewish homes, finding swarm and building fires with them, burning them. That was almost the entire time that I was there. Was that your choice or someone else's? No, that was our choice. They were, we had nobody with us then. They didn't send any soldiers with us. They just sent us, the ten of us, nine or ten of us, to there, and they brought us the food and we were on our own. Like if the army would have needed the regular army, they would have to call us. So there was nothing to do, so we decided to do that. The food they gave us, I traded in for fresh eggs or whatever I could, some pork, some... Uh, Fed some more substantial that they gave us. Whose choice was it to burn the books? Mine. And uh, naturally the boys go along, they gave, gave us something to do, and they don't object. The army didn't, the regular army at the Hungarian didn't object so much. They didn't bother with us. So we, uh, and uh, then I went out and uh, I had the, I had very, the horses that I had, well, one of them was a little blind, and one of them didn't walk straight. So I came into a farm, to a Pollock, and he comes from his farm with beautiful two horses. And I'm there with a soldier, with one of these misfits. And I says to him, you know, we got a lot of work to do here. You give us the, these horses, you take mine. I'll take good care on yours. And, and this soldier starts hollering, but let's go, we're gonna be in trouble here. I says to the guy, I said, you hear, he's hollering, he's getting angry, so you better do it fast. He gave us the horses, he gave us some uh, uh, fat, some uh, pork, what he had on the, he had us some flour and some eggs. And when I come back, so the officer, the one that, he said, what's this? He said, well, I, after all, it doesn't look nice for you to travel with horses like this. I figured I'll get better ones. I said, how did you do I said, I gave him a receipt, they'll give it back. So since then, I, naturally, he, he would swear by me. So we were working there, and uh, also at one time I would go out uh, since he let me let me wear Hungarian uniform because I had nothing to wear before we picked up a Budapest from the joint. So he lets me wear a Hungarian soldier uniform, but what did without it look a belt. Like? What did it look like? Green. 
a green uniform, but without a belt. But okay, belts are no problem for me. I was, I knew how to get things. So, uh, you know, like he would see a nice girl walk by, he says, can you talk to her for me? Uh, <laughs> uh, he really got a lot of confidence in me, and, uh, and I was able to, at the same time, I had better horses. I traveled, the kitchen traveled with us, the castle. If we went to, so I used to take all the blankets, because by then everybody threw away their twillin, their blanket, their things. So I used to take it, he said, what you do? And I said, I'm making you a comfortable seat. And then whenever we stopped, I, everybody took their blankets. Or we used to go for bread to the city while we were working in the field. So I used to sit with him, with the horses, he sat near me, and I used to take him bread always, and told the boys, I said, if you ever fight, I'm going to stop it. And they were very nicely cooperating, and they would divide it among themselves. You know, so that's how we managed somehow to survive. Were you able to hold on to any semblance of your Orthodox background? No. No. I, uh, we were down to a blanket, and that's it. That's the most essential thing. You had nothing, you had the clothes you had on you, plus a blanket, plus you had a dish. Because if they gave you something to eat, you needed to have a dish, and a, so that's what you had. What was a typical meal? It's according when and where. At times that I remember was like a, like hot water, like, it's called it a piece of, but you need to swim to catch up with the pee. You know, uh, and that's what they called a, uh, a meal. Uh, a piece of bread was a meal. Uh, they, gave you, uh, uh, they gave you a piece of bread, sometimes they gave you some marmalade with it, or sometimes they gave you a, a piece of fat, uh, uh, pork fat. The, the, what they make here, they make the lard out of it, the fat, the cheapest what there is. But the only thing we were always inventive. It was, if it was winter, we built a fire. They let us do that. Because when they gave us a break for lunch, sort of. So we used to take that fat, put it on a stick, and have the fat drop on the, drip on the bread. You know, it made a better meal. Uh, so it's, there was never, there was at one time that uh, no one was able to get to us. We were in, uh, we lived for a few days on uh, grass and uh, berries. Uh, there were so many different experiences in there. Uh, like uh, we were there very close to the Russians. The, Amer the Hungarian army and the Russian army were only one, one hillside against the other hillside. And two boys said to me, teach me how to say in, in Russian that I'm a, Jit, I'm a, a Jew and I want to. So I told them, all of, I, all of a sudden I hear the Russians holler, the why and this and that, the, uh, go back, turn around and go back. And uh, when they came back, they got caught. They got under the wire. So the officer asked me, he says, tell me, oh, he says, they told me they go and I says, they, they, they see they have no shoes and they, they saw a dead soldier over there. So, uh, so he gave him a slap in the face and that was finished. Because I, you know, I was able to, uh, but the Russians were so close to us, they would shoot through the, while they were carrying the soup for our group, they would shoot through the can, but it was carried on a horseback and to run out. There were times that I was in a position to, uh, to, to have the uh, farmers keep them near a uh, well, keep a can with uh, fresh milk. You know, there were kids that came out, they were younger than some of us died out from the original group, so they sent us uh, new guys that were younger. What was the age range in this group? Uh, early 20s, very early 20s. So they came out, some came out, like when they come from the city, they would come with chocolate. And what they says, I'll give you a piece of, like, they, we didn't have it to say, we had to build it on. He says, I'll give you a piece of chocolate if you... I said, no, 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 you do it yourself come with me. But I used to wake them up in the morning. I said, hey fellas, it's time to go down to the river and wash up. Don't lay and wait to die. 
If you're going to give up, you're going to die. And some of them did. Some of them did die. When because did you, they, they let themselves go. When did you first get reports about what was happening in the rest of Europe? Uh, we did it when we came back from Poland. Then we were walking back, partly walking, partly... In, uh, so we found out oh, what has happened. How did you find this out? How did I find out? But the local people that we were walking through our area, through the Carpathian. So and then already boys, everybody heard a little bit and we pieced it together that, oh, what happened and when they took him and where they took him and so on. So naturally it was a lot of heartbreak, it was a lot of crying, it was a lot of commotion. But that's all, that's all there was. That's all we were able to do. What did you think your future would hold? I, there was no thought of it. There was a hope from day to day of survival. When there was no place to go, they took us from Poland. We went back all the way, partly walked for days, partly in cattle cars. We went back all the way to Hungary, to Slovakia. And there we waited a little while. And then the Germans took us over because the Hungarians had no more work for us. While we were working, they were our uh, guards. Like thinking once I, I didn't go out, I met a friend, this guy that I was written up in, the, in California that I first found him out in L.A., George Donovan. I had typhoid, and he had then after that. So we actually kept one another alive. I, I, I don't think he would have survived without me, and I don't think I would have survived without his help. What did you do for each other? Well, we stayed in line and uh, carried water for the, uh, the guys in the kitchen in order to get a little warm soup. If you didn't go out, we slept and uh, we slept with our clothes we, because we slept in barns where we kept the hay. Sometimes you got up from under the snow. Your shoes were frozen because they were wet. And uh, these young, then already the regular army left uh, that watched us these visits, so then they took the kids they had a young, a youth organization in Hungary they called them the Niloshes they became out so they would come in and say who wants to go to the doctor take them in the back, pull it, finished or they would come in and uh, I couldn't get out of bed I, a bed. I couldn't get up and go to work and all of a sudden they come in and he hit me on the head and I fell into the snow I recall, but I managed to to get up and, and run to the group and go out to work. There I met some uh, German guys from the Wehrmacht that came back already from the war, from Poland. One was without a finger, one was uh, limping, one had no ear and shut off or whatnot. All people that came back from the, that saw real life. And my name being Berger, they were a Dukan Judebist. That was there constantly. I said, yes, I am a Jew. I have been a Jew. No, they didn't want to believe it, and they started bringing me their leftovers. Their leftovers were mm, fearful, you know, they were with good fat. And, you know, and they brought me more than I could eat, so we managed. How did you feel when you saw them? When I saw... Well, we never really dealt with the uh, uh, with the Nazis uh, the, themselves, with the uh, uh, with the top ones. We only encountered these guys after after they they saw what life is about. There was one time we get back from work and we picked up our and I we were in the middle of the town, the square, like we had to walk across, and there they lined up three in a line, three in a line. So the one that every stable at every bar had a sort of an eldest. We had in our group a guy by the name of Meltzer. We, because he was sent to us because we were known as a punishing group, a Bindertersauser, which they call them Hungarian, which was a tough group. I mean, the, go out to, and this guy they sent out to us as a punishment. He was an old man at 37. He was the only one that had his twiller about this size. 
In the morning he would get up and put them on when it's dark. He would be the only one that gave away his fat, his pork, for a... Uh, and he was standing there in line. I says to him, what is all they going to give up soap? I says, uh-uh. Not when they with their bayonets drawn. That's not for soap. That's for a punishment. I said, you know what? You go, I'll stay. It comes to take two lines, six. I don't hear any shots fired, and I don't see them come back. I says, what are they doing to him? So they took us into a yard, a closed yard. There were six chairs. At the sixth chair, there were two guys standing, and around it was soldiers. Hungarian still. And everybody was sent to one chair, it says, pants down. You lowered your pants, and they were both with a stick. It says 25 stick. For what is that for? In order you should know to keep the place clean. After all, we said they're in a barn. And all. So, you know, you lift up your head, you get hit. So the guy hit you on the head. And I turned around to this guy and I says to him, you know, you're old enough to have a son like my age. Would you like anybody doing that to your son? They were like civilians working for them. He says, there is nothing I can do. You see these guys, with a, if we don't do it to you, they're going to do it to us. So we have to do it. When it came, they counted about 15, and, but, uh, and then they say to the guy next to me that he could go already. So I stopped pulling up my pants and goes, no, 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 he says, you only, you're not ready to go. When I came back, that guy cried like a baby. Then he saw me, how beat up I was. The next day we were standing in line for a little soup and he says to me, you know, boy, the beating you got, I would have never survive. And I am from around here. I know my way around. Let me say goodbye to you. And he took off. Who was this? Uh, the guy named Meltzer. He was from, uh, as a matter of fact, I tried to locate him also, like I did the other guy, but he had died just about a year before he lived in Belgium. He only died a couple of years ago. Uh, but uh, these are the things. Then I wound up at the same place working at the kitchen, and while I was at the kitchen, there was a butcher. Had the, at the yard, they had a butcher. There, so I would trade him uh, salt. Salt was a big article for him. For, uh, I would give him salt for meat, for fat. Uh, or we had that then the Wehrmacht guys were watching the warehouse. So I, we would go two guys, one would keep him busy, the other one would steal a, uh, another bundle of beans or whatever it is to cook. That I remember that they, when it came orders to march to leave that place, it was just before Pesach, 1945 already. That was, a, they were marching us to Mauthausen. Was this a death march? That was like a death march, yes. The day before, for, for, for Pesach, for the Seder, I remember I made them, I made mashed potatoes. I was a chef, I was then in the kitchen working, and hamburgers. And as we were marching, because that night came an order and we marched, and we just saw the Russian planes, we saw them light up the streets to see where it is, we saw the American planes, we were, we were only hoping hit us. On the way there, whenever we marched, we would pick up a bone in the street that the dogs got through it. It was already in the spring, so we would like, they got the potatoes that they planted in the manure. So we would take it up and eat those potatoes. Uh, again, myself and a couple of my friends had it a little better because I had some fat that I accumulated. So we, we were eating some fat too, so. We would stop in the middle of the march and they would come, they would start digging a hole. And uh, after they finished, they just took the guns away, but dug them, boom, 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 and finished. And they killed them. How many people started on this march? On this march, uh, I think there were the original 220, because with the, that they filled in. They were filling it in, so I think there was the uh, about 200. How many people survived? 
Well, as far as I could see, the, I, I was able to tell you about five of us that survived. So we got to, to Mauthausen then. While in Mauthausen it was so packed, they didn't have what to do with us. So there was one day that I walked around and I saw the camp and I saw the people were carrying out the dead ones. But we hardly got past the gate. It was so crowded in there by then. From there, took a few days, they marched us to, which they had built then a camp in a forest, which is called Gunskirchen. On that march to Mauthausen, from Mauthausen actually, uh, I carried this guy, Donenberg, he carried me. The way he was, to go back, he was the guy that his parents remained in Budapest because of uh, uh, Wallenberg. So they were saved. Matter of fact, they were the first one to meet me and so on. Anyway, we sort of carried one another and we made it into Gutskirchen. We came there, there were barracks, long barracks, I don't know how many. People slept on the beam. We were, if one wanted to turn around, in the morning they would carry out guys they will just lose now because people were carried out constantly. Uh, so we had already the uh, armies. We had one of our friends, one of our group, because you form like a close-knit uh, uh, friendship with certain people. And one of them was going with a water truck to the city to bring in water to the camp. And he always brought news. One day I asked him, I said, tell me, what's the truth? He says, that's not what I'm telling you. They know we're not close. They know we're near the end. But I, for one, realized what, how many lives this guy saved by these false rumors. That just a little longer, just another day, and we'll be free. Just another day. The Russians are so close, the Americans are so close, and, and uh, the English and the British. He made up stories. He told me it's stories. But the rumors went through, and it survived. It made a lot of people hold on a little longer. This is tape four. Our survivor is Walter Berger, and today is May 21st, 1996. I said we left off that from Mauthausen we took that march to the camp. That camp had thousands of people, literally thousands. What were conditions like by the time you had reached it? By the time we reached it, there's a lot of people that never made it because they shot them on the way. Uh, there are a lot of people who I think died even on their own. They, they just lay down and that was it. When we got there, there was no water whether they didn't finish it, whether they didn't plan to do anything. There were no lotteries, there was a, a huge, um, they dug out a huge hole, but huge, and they put planks across it. So if you had to go to the toilet, you were just on that plank, and if you were too weak to, and you couldn't uh, stand up, and you fell backwards, or you fell in, that was the end of you. Uh, it was awful. There was hardly any food. Who was in charge of this camp? Uh, the Germans. That was already uh, the Germans. We had nothing to do anymore with the Hungarians. They left us uh, there. But the Hungarians, there were, when the Germans took over, the regular Germans, those that guided us in the wake, as I said before, they gave us food and then and so on. At one time, that I must go back, the, when the Hungarians, not the regular, the regular soldiers, those mitzvahs, what I call them, those kids, they were too small to carry a rifle, so they would carry it on their shoulder. If somebody uh, would say something to them, so once I comes over a big guy, he says, you have trouble with him? I'll take you back of the line. Back of the line means he takes you and shoots you without question. How old were these boys? Uh, teenagers. They were teenagers. They joined, a, I think they wore black outfits. They were real mischief. They were terrible. Anyway, 
go back to Gottskirchen, which we were finally, finally liberated. It came in the evening of uh, May the 5th, a little white car, all of a sudden the guards that were there, he says, See, look at my rifle, I never fired the rifle, I never shot anybody. They, all of a sudden they were talking to us. Then before nightfall, a little car with Americans passed by with a white flag on it, and we knew we were liberated. We also knew it was almost nightfall. And we knew enough to be afraid that some Germans shouldn't want to knock on us or take it out on us. They shouldn't come in and, and really do a number on us. So that same close-knit group of ten, we got together and we went out. First of all, we, we went over to the supply house with the sort of a kitchen where they had food. They had... Uh, which they called honey, but it was actually sugar, and then, but it was sweet. I don't know how somebody managed to open one of those five-gallon cans, and we already said it was muddy, it was snowing on the outside, the outside, it was mud, there was no roads. Uh, up to this day, I could see on my finger where I cut it on there, it was full of blood and full of mud, however, it had some of that substance on some of that sweet stuff, so I ate it all together. But we started out from camp, the, the ten of us. One of them spoke English. It was about two or three highly intelligent, learned men that spoke the, the, the doctor or uh, close to become a doctor, educated. And as we walked the road, get out on the road, we walk and taught Welt, Linz. All of a sudden, the whole American soldiers they were laying on the side of the road as we came. This guy spoke to them. We didn't know what he said, what he didn't say. This guy identified us, you know, that, but they already know the soldiers or what it is. By daybreak, we got under the city of Wales. And there, we had mechanics. We had with us Everything. So all of a sudden, when the daybreak, when we were marching through, the women were there, the natives, whatever, with fresh rolls and offered food. One of them broke in, one of the guys, we broke it into a garage, and they had uh, uh, meat, can, cans with meat, and actually food. This guy, the doctor that was with us, he took it away. He let us open one can, he got us down to a brook. And we all had to wash. We all had to take our shirts off, and he had as weak as we were. And he gave a piece of roll and a small piece of that to eat. He said, no, you're not going to eat it, and he didn't let us. This naturally it didn't sit well for him because we were hungry, we were starved. We could have eaten, uh, we were eating bones that the dogs left over, or eating the potatoes that were... However, we obeyed, he convinced us that it was good. We got in, into the... Uh, railroad track there. There, they had all type of uh, sugar. What we walked in sugar just to walk on it too, to see how this food. We got it into a. We took a flatbed by the by the station, and we found in one of the cars a uh, dishes uh, or deep dishes. So we. We put everything and we set out to the city, to the town. We came over on a side street, there was a store. A guy had a store, a storefront. There was nothing in the store because it was right there, it was empty. But he lived upstairs and this was downstairs, was the store. We told him to clean out, we want to occupy this. So we got in there and we got him to make us hot water. We washed and scrubbed one another because we picked up all these supplies at the railroad. So we got rid of our clothes, and one another was uh, washing all around, especially in the hair that was full of lice that were in the skin. So he took a scrub brush, and we cleaned up. And whatever anybody had, we put on, and we cleaned up. And from there, we, uh, we went out to get something to eat, so there was no problem. We were able to manage. 
all of a sudden a nice day comes over a uh, the uh, uh, with red band the uh, uh, police assistance in Germany and Austria and he says you cannot stay there so he took us into an army camp it was, it was occupied by the American army was there first before we got the end of the town we tried to get a truck started uh, uh, and then we put there with a mechanic so we figured we'll push it and we'll get it we'll go straight home we had a mechanic with us there was some Jewish soldiers they spoke to us in Yiddish American soldiers they were crying like babies so when they called us with the truck he said no you got to take it back all of a sudden naturally we don't understand what he's saying and one guy comes over he says don't worry just keep going and they pushed it off the road. It was right after the... So, uh, but we went into that camp and there were soldiers, American soldiers. They gave us their, from their ration packages, chocolate or whatever they had, cigarettes. The first time that they ever met a Schwarzen, a black guy. It was a guy, he had a lot, I don't know what office he held or what rank he had. But he had his combat boots, and he had a couple of pistols, and he gets, uh, gets us lined up, and he says, come, to follow him. And he gets in front of a store, a man shop, a fancy man shop, and he, as he turned around like a mule, he kicks open the, uh, the glass, it was a glass front, and waves us in, and he stays there like this here, I can still picture him, a big black guy. That everybody takes shoes, socks, whatever there is. And we did. And he brought us back home, actually. It was right a day after. Uh, don't worry about it. Then it, from there, then came the uh, regular army. They took us into a big camp, into a real camp where they fed us. They were cooking mostly veal and rice. We were sleeping inside, outside, wherever. What camp was this? I don't know, it was in Linz in Austria, I don't know the name of it. It was an army camp, a, a German army camp occupied by the American army. And for then they started to list us to take the, uh, take the attendance, you know, making some kind of system out of it. So they took the checks, like, you know, the name, uh, date of birth, and so on, uh, you know, and where are we from? From Czechoslovakia because since Czechoslovakia was a loved, admired country by all. So we were the first ones to be put on buses. And well, I think we slept overnight. We slept by different people, different houses in the town. And then they took us as far as the Russians were in Pilsen. And they gave it over then. We took the train and from there, already everybody went their own way. We come there and they having, uh, you know, the Russian soldiers, as we were traveling with them, they were very poorly outfitted. They had some of the rifles they carried, they were on strings, instead of having a belt. They would, uh, they would take, uh, if you had a clock, and they robbed somebody and had watches, they would give you watches for a big clock. They, uh, but one thing, if you showed them, if you were on the train, regular trains that, that they were on, and if you showed them at a Nazi, or this is a Nilos, which was one of the Hungarian, he would just take them and throw them off the train. As the train was traveling, he threw them right off. No calls, no nothing. Just pointed out to him and he did it to him. So then I wound up in Prague. From Prague we managed with the broken railroads, whatever, go to Bucharest. In Bucharest they had like an information center where they give you a uh, identification uh, thing that was already rendered by the Jewish organization from America. I worked my way home, home to Raqqa, to my hometown. What was that like for you? <laughs> well, it was, I don't know what I'm going to find. I didn't hear anything. There was a main railroad that ran up to the city barracks of Berehova. That was the railroad that ran from one at Czechoslovakia to the other. I got over there, and there we had a small train that ran close by our town. Then I got out there, I met a guy named Agathosman. 
from our town. He says, you know, your sisters are home. Naturally, I couldn't wait to get there. When I got there, they already, I had, uh, there were four of them were there. No, one of them was home, the oldest, Rose. The other three went to Romania, to Bucharest, because they were providing you with some information on what to do or what. And we already knew that the sister in Czechoslovakia survived, and we already knew that my brother, my older brother, is in Budapest, because he was liberated, he never went home. He went to Budapest, and there he, he was organizing these young boys who were left homeless and without parents, and was sending them to Israel until the Russians would try to get him and he escaped. Until they found out that he ran this type of organization. So when I came home, I, uh, I was happy to be there, tried to see some of the neighbors. The one that squealed on my parents skipped on. They feared that uh, since I'm home, I might do something to him. Skip town, he had a uh, grown son, so they would stay up day and night and watch him. He lived uh, sort of at the end of the town. And then came a time that I uh, went over to, like it would be the mayor of the town. It was a family, the name was Bihun. And he was, from the old days, a friendly to the family. I come up there one morning. He was still sleeping. He says to me, wait, let me get dressed. He got dressed, I went in, he offered me breakfast. And uh, I tell him, listen, I was at this in this field, and there this neighbor uh, chased after me with a cycle and, uh, and so on. He says to me, that's not your problem. That I could, but he says to me like this, they, I could get you back to every, all the properties you had without any problem. Since you have the education you have, I could give you, make you headmaster of the school, to run the school system. But my advice to you, don't stay here. It's not a place for the Jews to stay. And uh, I took it very serious, what he told me, because I know he was sincere. I was not in his way. He stayed, nothing to gain, but neither way. So I wound up going to Czechoslovakia, deep into Czechoslovakia, which was the Sudeten. And we had there, my brother was then already in Prague with my sister. I, I, uh, my other sisters were there. We all wound up there. Two of them got married there. And we had uh, papers to come to America. Because I have a relatives, I have here cousins. From my mother's side, I have quite a sizable family here. And so we had paid thin. The Czech water was not used during the war. So we were able to get a visa. So my uh, one married sister, the second one, and I and her husband and myself came here first. My other one had to wait till her husband gets a visa. My younger sister, who also was on those papers, she was her husband, she also got married by then to a guy that she met in uh, uh, Theresienstadt in that concentration camp. So they moved to Israel. So they give a very, uh, very good account of themselves, thank God. And uh, so we wound up here. What had happened to your parents? My parents got killed, uh, they, they got to Auschwitz. The same day, next day, whatever. They never survived. But uh, we know the date because my sisters were there. When did you first arrive in the United States? I came here in uh, August of 1946. That means a, a year after the liberation, a little more than a year. I arrived. I had cousins here. They had a uh, they had a cafeteria on 37th Street and 7th Avenue, 7th Avenue cafeteria. It was a self-service cafeteria. I got a job there. It was when we got all we got over there. We got some cold washed. It was a hot day, and 
After that, I got right away, they gave me a job there as a boss boy. Naturally, I couldn't expect more by not knowing the language. They were in the restaurant business, so they also had a restaurant on Fifth Avenue, 7-Eleven Fifth Avenue. There, I was the boss boy, the, the waiters, the waiters, they treated me already better because they knew I'm a cousin to the owner, so out of their table they gave me and, uh, and I wound up working there until my brother-in-law that came at the same time with me also got a job there and one cousin's husband's brother came and he said, well, he knows better, the other one was Gamakala Yitzla. And, uh, so anyway, what would happen in a family, I told them, I said, I'm going to quit. So the cousin, the rich cousin that she, Reggie, she lived at the Essex house then. And uh, she came over, she says, uh, you shouldn't do that. The, besides that, they had a bar and the guy said to me, the solid man, says to me, you know, with your height, you could become either a bartender or you could... Uh, be a solid man, be willing to teach you, to show you how to do it. And so I go over to my cousin, and he says to me, you know, Wally, my brothers were three-year boss boys before they become waiters. I says, you know what, Reggie? That's why I stayed in Europe a little longer, that I don't have to take three years to be a boss boy in order to become a waiter. She says, I said, so, anyway, the manager told them this, nothing to do. So I left, I had no money. Whatever I had then, my sisters, my two sisters were still in Europe. So I sent them the money that I had. As a matter of fact, when I went from the restaurant and I saw a movie about Benesh, he, a, a newsreel, Benesh, he was the president after Masaryk died, the vice president. So I went in the newsreel and then I took the sewage train to go home and I feel in kind of Karelsi and I had to change because I lived in Ridgewood. And I feel for my pocket, and still, I don't have it. And it was everything what I had. I run back to the, where I had a coffee, I run back to the theater, nothing. And a nice Sunday, Saturday, I was then, perhaps I was undecided whether do I want to be Orthodox or don't I. From what I saw, I had a choice so if the cousin comes over, I'm making a call to a friend of mine, and he knocks on the booth, the telephone booth, he says, uh, you got a postcard. The postcard came from Elmont, New Jersey, stating, he says, dear Mr. Boyger, I have found something that belongs to you. With proper identification, I'll be happy to return it to you. Signed, Joseph Roof. I couldn't wait, ready to get out there, so I borrowed from my brother-in-law $5. I asked the cop how to get it. He said, well, you take the subway, and then you change for the Long Island Railroad, and then you take a bus. I come there Saturday night, as long would have it, the guy in home. The guy in home, I says to the old lady that was there, he said, when do you think? He said, tomorrow. So I came back the next day, and she comes out, she says, I just got back from the Kircha. I mean, they were not Jewish. And he can, she called him Joseph, he comes down and says, shows me my wallet. He says, I'm sure it's yours. I had in there the pictures of my parents, the pictures that you see, whatever I had my social security there's number, so he knew where to write to me. <coughs> and uh, says, thank you very much. And he says, wait a minute, let me just see some. So he takes it back. I had there about $50 in the, in the wallet. I knew how much I had because that's all I had. And it was nicely put, you know, together. And he takes me, he says, wait a minute, let me get dressed and I'll take you to, how, is the taxi waiting for you? I says, no, it's a nice weather to go. I didn't tell him I have nobody to have the taxi wait. I figured in case he didn't know, what am I going to do? So he got dressed and to drive me back to the station. He took along a little girl, a niece of his. So I wanted to give her some money. I said, here, go buy ice cream. He says, you don't give it nothing. 
He says, no, you didn't save up the, that money when you got there so easily. I see you just came to this country. And he said to me, he found it in the theater, he kicked it with his foot. He didn't want to give it to the attendant, because then it would have, gotten, it would have never gotten it. So he wrote to me and gave it back to me. That was one of the first incidents that I had. And then, so when I was working as a busboy, then I gave out that job. So my cousin says, what are you going to do? You just came here. I said, you know what, Reggie? If I come to ask you for something, don't give me. I went to the, then I heard from some people that there is the highest, an organization highest. They were on Lafayette Street, 425, if I remember. And then they have another office at 15 Park Row. That was the Joint Distribution Committee. No. Yeah, the Joint. So when I came up there to the Joint, they said to me, there were two girls sitting there. One spoke German and one spoke a broken Yiddish. What can they do for me? They give $35 for a single guy. I says, no, I also heard you giving money, you giving jobs. He says, okay, but we give you, uh, I said, so far I have what to eat. I have my rent is paid. I took a furnished room not far from the cousin. And they sent me in to see a Mr. Ruben. I said, the money that you want to give me, you see this guy over there with crutches, with a beard, with a baby, and he said, give it to him. I never took a penny. They called me, they got a job for me. Then the highest called me, they got also a job for me. So I got my brother-in-law that job, and I took one to work in a provision house. I knew nothing about the business, but I had a very, very nice a Mr. Wolf, a Romanian guy, who was like a father to me. Very, very understanding. So I was with him until I uh, met my bride. How did you meet her? We met, uh, you know, uh, Greener would hang out to the same place where you find them. It's really Williams Boy on the east side. I happened to be closer to Williams Boy from where I lived, so I met her. Her cousin had a, uh, it wasn't a candy store, it was, it was maybe a soda fountain more or like a sort of like a luncheonette because there was a yeshiva up the block on uh, Wilson Street and it was at the corner division of Wilson. What's her name? Oh, my bride. Well, uh, then her name was Mary. I said, where do you, a Jewish girl, come over the name Mary? So she had an uncle in Chicago who saw that the kid that came and said, Marty is, uh, is not a nice name, they call you Mary. But when we, then when we came to go for citizen papers, we changed it to Margie. So she became <laughs> Margie instead of Mary. And when did you get married? We got married in, oh, that I better know, uh, in November, uh, November 30th, 1947. We were preparing for the wedding on Saturday night. It wasn't a catered affair. It was a shul on Stanhope Street in Brooklyn, in a recreation where they, since I was in the provision business, so I had the, the Dan Rivington Street a store, and he was ready to slice the cook and slice the meats if I bring them. But while we were preparing the tables, there was a, a UN meeting, and that was the night, Friday, Saturday night, when they pronounced the uh, uh, State of Israel. So naturally, the happiness was great. And uh, so after I prepared everything, I went home, got dressed, and we got married. We were with the group. Margie was very much hurt. Her, her father wasn't here then. What but was your decision? You had told us that you had to make a decision about resuming an Orthodox lifestyle. What did you choose? Well, I chose the Orthodoxy after I, we had the two children. And I didn't feel good. I, was, I had a, a store that was open my shops. And I was home when, uh, whether my wife will agree for me to say that or not, but I feel that this is the fact. I, my kid went to Talbotora, Mahziki Talbotora, 14th Avenue. And I was home on Friday night and I made Kiddush. And the happiness in the children's faces. Uh, I, so there and then I decided that's it. 
That's not the reason I survived Hitler. And that was not the reason to bring children into the world. And this is the... I knew about things because after all at home I was not a baby when I was brought up and knew everything and since then made up my mind and, and the good thing was I had a brother-in-law, my oldest brother-in-law, Rose's husband. He was ultra-Orthodox, very learned man, I mean really learned. And he never did he tell me why aren't you religious. And then I think I even asked him, I says, how come shy you never? He says, I figure you'll figure it out for yourself. You cannot force anybody to be what they don't want to be. And I think that I'm happy with my choice. When I came here, I went to visit my rabbi from home. What's when I was name? a bigger boy, his name was Halpert, that's from Meyer Halpert. He was a ultra-Orthodox man, a beard. He was learning with the old man on East Broadway. That's how long that he was. And he says to me, he said, listen, America is a beautiful country. You could be orthodox, you don't have to be a fanatic. He lost his wife and part of the family in Europe. We were quite friendly with him. He says, I remarried. This woman is doing extreme. She tied around the doorknobs for Pesach and got a cat and my, got socks for the cat and got uh, covers on the uh, stove, which is mamish as good as the first. A danger to, to your safety, to your life. He says, that's not Yiddishkeit, that's Fanatishkeit. But a Yid can life down in America. And that... Okay. This is tape five. Our survivor is Walter Berger. Today is May 21st, 1996. Could you tell us your daughter's names? Yes. My oldest one is Doris, Duero, the, the named after, uh, after Margie's mother. And the second one is named after my mother. Her English name is Hedy, Henshaw. How do you spend your free time now? Well, I don't have much free time. I try to keep busy, uh, not that I have to go in and stay all day in the business because I have reduced a lot of my activities in the business. However, I get up at 6 o'clock to the first meeting, I have my breakfast, I visit my houses, I go back to the office. and. Um, sit around and do a little work. What is your business? I am in the real estate business. I, uh, I own and manage some apartment houses, some with partners, some my own. And uh, that about takes up most of my time. In the winter time, we spend a lot of time in Florida. In the summer, we try to travel some. We try in a way to make up at our old age, but we lost at our youth. So this is what we are, I at least I'm trying to make up for some of that time. What organizations do you belong to? Well, I always was, am interested, uh, was interested in community life. When the children were in yeshivas, I made sure that I was there. They, when they, there was Ezra Academy, which was a junior high school, that had organized just then. I was one of the organizers, so one of the active participants. I live here in this building since 1961, I believe. We moved here because Margie's father, who was left alone after losing his wife and the, other, the younger children, and Margie was the only one left, so even though being in the real estate business, we bought something where he was able, we were able to have him with us and live by himself. We have in the front of this house a apartment that consists of a room, a kitchen, and a bathroom. If he felt like being with us, he was with us. If he wanted to be on his own, he was on his own. It was his choice. And I got involved in the synagogue activities to a point that 
I was president of Benaiser Rothman Heights for about 10 years until I gave it up because I figured no one should stay on in that office too long. We had a, I was active in their Mr. and Mrs. Club and their men's club. And uh, we also used to have a Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and uh, fundraisers such as UJA. I am the chairman for the shul from UJA, also the chairman of bonds, of Israeli bonds, and every other activity that comes up in the community. If some people, especially my wife, if anybody talks about moving, she says, unless you move in Israel, would. And I've been most active over 30 years, almost what is over almost 40 years, for 35 years, 35, 36 years, that I've been active here from the very first that I moved in. And now as neighborhood changed, I have a lot of influence on the new people that moved in the last few years that came from the same general area that I come from. They have a lot of trust and confidence in me. I understand their predicament. I understand what their parents were like because I was their age. And I feel that I am kind of useful, and I do some good use here. That's why I am staying here in this area of Borough Park. Uh, even though a lot of people ask, how come? I said, if it would be a question to raise children, I probably wouldn't, re wouldn't live here. But at my age, I don't care whether the Hasidim move in. They're not my type of Hasidim that move in. The, if it's a non-Jew moves in, also it don't bother me because my children are not going to play with them because they don't live here. So therefore, we are staying here, and, uh, and whatever comes up, you know, go in the evening to show some meetings at night, uh, play some cards for entertainment only. Uh, that's about... Uh, I put in a full day. I leave in the morning, as I said, when I come home from school, have breakfast, don't come home till about five, six o'clock. Whether I wake all that time, I wouldn't say so. Whether I wake as hard as I used to, I don't. If there's a question to go someplace, I can always manage to get away, as I did today, practically all day. I missed nothing. And this is about the uh, story of my life. When were you first able to talk about your experiences? I was able to talk about it. I found the need when I came here and I had a cousin of mine and they have children, teenage children, a boy and a girl. And she was very nice to us. Her name was Yola Waltz. We passed on since then. And the children asked me once when we were there, she says, tell me, Wally, did you, what type of movies did they show you? I said, movies? I said, do you know what this war was all about, what it was? I said, so you mean you didn't see no movies? Go and tell, tell her, I said, not only didn't I see a movie, I had one pair of underwear that I never changed because you couldn't carry the second pair. And what what found me to talk about it when an adult cousin, I wouldn't name his name, says to me, you think we had it easy here? I says, why, what was so wrong? You know, we couldn't get any meat. We had to eat chicken. I says, compare it to some bones out of the street that the dogs got through with. And compare it to some potato peels that was, that was five days old and rotten. Compare that chicken to that and see what it is. So, I mean, you did not you know so little of what we went through. So I found the necessity to talk about it. And as a few years went by, I says, wait a while, is that really true what I went through? Is it possible that I survived without food? That I survived to the bitter cold, got up without any medication, survived the typhoid fever? To get up from under the snow? with frozen shoes, frozen feet, did I really survive it? So that sort of got me to get into it 
and uh, talk about it because I, I saw I had to talk to myself to remind myself and to convince myself and to realize myself and so that's when I I kept back not whenever I had a chance I speak about it I if I if I am between like the group that were here like a Mr. and Mrs. what I had or that was mostly of people who did not experience these things they were here during the war perhaps some were in the army some were just before the army and I had a chance to speak to them uh, it gave me a lot of satisfaction that that I was able to do it and I honestly feel that we survivors were left alive to tell the story. What gave you the strength to survive? I, I would say most of it is the luck, but a lot of it I feel had to do with my upbringing. I was, I had a tough upbringing. There was no, we were not a baby or a, we, uh, for instance, we, uh, when the kids went to school, to junior high school, my wife would say, why don't you drive them? Why do not let me drive them? I said, honey, it's only two blocks to the bus and then the bus will take them. The kids even know to say, you know, daddy walked five kilometers to, uh, to school at that age. These things came back to me with strength. They kept me strong. They kept me, I was not baby, as a baby, we, we were a little bit different than the average children that we had to account for our time as we do, and that was all play, there was also time with, with responsibility, and uh, I attribute a lot of it, because I would have never been able to work uh, the, uh, the dishes the way I had to, I never would have been able to finagle around with the, with the uh, become a expert for the uh, horses. Uh, if not for that uh, upbringing which I had. It's talking about horses, I know, remember at one time I borrowed a, a set of horses from my uncle and Bilka went and, and did the um, planting of the, uh, in the spring, whatever we were planting. Because in those days the government did not want to work for the Jews no more uh, during the Hungarian. So I, not was strange to me, and nothing was too difficult, and there was nothing that I was able to somehow get get through. Were you ever able to locate any former prisoners or inmates? I was fortunate. I've been always trying to locate one particular fellow by the name of uh, George Donabuik. He's the one that had mentioned he. I'm responsible for him being alive. He's responsible for my being alive. He carried me, I carried him when it needed to be. I finally found from somebody that he's someplace in uh, Los Angeles and he's in the photography business. I got on the phone and called. I know his name is Donnerberg. I know if his name was uh, his name in Hungary was Yuri, it would be George. So I picked up the phone and called. So uh, I finally, one operator says to me, yes, we have a thousand dogs listed in guy photography by George Dornboy. I said, may I have his number? She gave me the number, it was very nice. I call him up, I says, who is this, it's George. And I says to him, that's El Mojero, that's too garish, I wanted to make sure that, that he is the one. So I asked him, I says, listen, uh, are you standing up or sitting down? I says, uh, he says, no, I says, you would never guess who it is, but I'll give you a hint. Many years ago, I was a red-headed, tall guy, and we were together. He jumped, I, mean, I could hear him jump. He knew who I was. He said there are many nights, many days that he was thinking, whatever happened to me? Because he wound up uh, joining the army. Which army? The American army, and from then he wound up being in Israel in the army, and then he wound up being in the, uh, he's also a guy that knows how to get around, knows how to get things. And 
as I mentioned before, he didn't even go home after the liberation. I went to, I, since I stopped to Budapest, so I went and told his parents that he had survived. And they knew about me very well because if he rode home, he always said, well, I cooked something special for us. So we were inseparable. When did you finally get to see him? July and 40, when was it? Two years ago, 1963. In July, we went out there for a weekend. 1994, yeah. Boy, time flies. It was the 94 in July. What was it that was, like? What it was like? Well, he's in the photography business, so he sent me a picture of himself and his wife. However, my dear wife, on this picture I don't look good, on this one my hair is no good, and and she slept, so she slept, so she don't go. I said, you know what, we've got to go out there. When we got to the airport, so I keep telling him, I said, George, I have to be a place where there is a shul and a kosher place. He is not into those things. So I found out that the Beverly, uh, whatever is, uh, the name of it, that that's a kosher hotel, and my long would have it, they were taken because the owners, Beverly somewhere, the owners uh, had an off roof, so the hotel was occupied by them. I finally checked in at another hotel, and Doris had a friend there that she called her up and she prepared some alamgit and take home food for Shabbos. And when we came to the airport, so they asked him, I says, tell me, what does he look like? He says, I have no idea, he might have a black head, he might have a long beard, whether he's still a redhead, I don't know. But whatever it is, he's my friend, and he's the one that saved my life, and I wanna, I am anxious to see him. As we get off the plane, I see a girl walks by us, and she calls out Burger. So I turn around and says, did you call the name Burger? She says, is that you? So then I see from the corner of my eye, she's pointing and back of me to the people that I'm the one they're waiting for. So the excitement there was, the entire news media of LA was at the airport, and they may have had an interview with us. And uh, we had uh, we spent the uh, week on Sunday. We went out to his house. Saturday afternoon, he came over where I stayed, uh, and then we walked through. Uh, and uh, he put on a cap because he didn't know whether I was there. I also wear one of these caps. So people saw us, and LA, so they saw us at the Times, at the Los Angeles Times, Sunday Times. So people stopped us, are you the guys that were on the television the other day? So it was quite exciting. As a matter of fact, I hope to see him next month. Maybe we'll fly down there too. And we're planning, perhaps if he, he's about to retire now, give up the business, so maybe we'll take a trip and backtrack all the places we've been to. If at all possible, we could wake it in. What advice do you have for your children, your grandchildren, future generations? The future generation, well, and Yiddish, they say, which I would also say means that you, more or less, in a free world, you could practically predict your future or, or counter your future. And since I came from Czechoslovakia and their president was a very beloved president, Thomas Masaryk, Thomas Garak Masaryk, that we call them the father of the country. There was a anti-Semitic vein in that man. He was one of the greatest, in my opinion. He had a little flag on, on his uh, uh, desk or near him, and the Czech flag, and it says Pravda Vichati. That means the truth will always win. Be truthful. Try to help people as much as you can. Give your children an education as much as we tried for you, because that's something that you will always have. I made it without having too much education. Thank God, God was good to me. But education, 
education, and that helps. Then uh, you state your fellow Jew, your fellow person, love Israel, because if we're going to have a strong Israel, a Holocaust will never happen. Not that the world, because as we see, the world learned very little. They still strength is still a big factor. Uh, and this is what we need. So that's why my message would be to all Jews. If we didn't have an Israel, we would have had a Holocaust. So Israel is the important uh, thing, and I work for it. When we went for a visit two years ago, I think it was two years this summer, through Europe to backtrack with my two daughters and the oldest granddaughter, she was then finished with school. It was a heartbreaker, but it was, I think, one of the best, one of the better lessons that the children, as tough as it was for Baji to show, this is where I didn't say goodbye to my mother and children. But we made up for it. After that trip, we went to Israel. We spent 10 days in Israel. And coming back from our area in, in a city that we went past the cities, being in a city that had all the luxuries, all the good stuff, and now they stay in line for a piece of bread or for milk. And you come to Israel and you see, Baruch Hashem, the wealth and the product and the life. So it gives you great satisfaction. And this is what I, what I would finish up with, keep it real strong. Thank you on behalf of the Shoah Foundation. Thank you for taking your time and giving me this opportunity. Perhaps my family I know will know about it, and perhaps other people will learn from the past, because this is a past that should never happen again among Jews. I thank you for doing it. I think it's a great thing. I think it's something that will be appreciated by generations to come. And we are still here to tell it and to tell it the way it was. So thank you again. Could you tell us about this photograph? Yes, that's my grandfather, my father's father. He lived with us. Matter of fact, I grew up while he was with us. His name? His name is Meyer, Meyer Berger. And uh, he was at the age of 94 when he died. He died in February of 1932. It was a Friday night or a Shabbos morning. How did you get this picture? This picture, one of my sisters got it from the neighbors. They got very, one of the very, very few that we were able to recover. Can you tell us about this photograph? Yes. This photograph is of my grandmother, Rivka Hollander, my mother's mother. She got to be into her 80s, to best of my information. She was about 82 and was taken away to Auschwitz, died there. She, uh, when the picture was taken, I really have no idea. It might have been taken sometimes in the 30s because that's when her daughter from America was visiting, and I think that was when that picture was taken, the best of my estimation and uh, realizing what it looks like. Yeah, this picture is my mother's picture. As you see, she was a beautiful lady. I don't know when the picture was taken. I don't know how old she was then. It, I got a copy of it to my sisters. I don't know even which one it is, but I, uh, I'm very proud having it. Yeah, that's a picture of my parents and two of my sisters, three of my sisters, other than a brother. When it was taken, I would not know the year, but it should be very close to the, uh, I suppose in the, it could have been taken in the early 40s or late 30s. It got to me again, like the rest of them. One of my sisters got it from a neighbor. Could you tell us the names of the people? Yes, if it starts from the right, 
sitting down is my younger sister. She is, uh, her name is Elsie, they called her, Reisel Ruchl in Yiddish. Above her standing is Gitsefeige, Gizi, or she's also known as Gloria. She's the second from the oldest. In the middle, that's my father. Yes, and uh, standing from back home is my mother. And next to her, next to my mother, is my older sister, Rose. And sitting down is my little brother, Moishi, who did not survive, who, as I mentioned before, was killed on the, in the, on the march two days before liberation. His name is, they called him Moishi, his name is Moishi Nachemia. And the picture got to us again through neighbors. You could enlarge it a little bit. Could you tell us about this? Yeah, this is a picture of Mbilke on the cemetery. To the right of the Matseve, of the monument, is my mother. That's the Matseve of her father. I don't know the year he died in. His name? And his name was Chaim Schmiel. Chaim Schmiel Hallander. And to the left of the Matsaiva is my mother's sister. His name was Laiku. That's what we called her. She also went to the Al Kiddush Hashem. This picture was taken probably in the late, late thirties. Because again, it was something that was probably sent to a uh, relative in America. Who's in this photo? In this photo is uh, my older brother and the sister, my sister, right, the one younger than I. That picture was taken and while they were in school in the gymnasium in Brno, in Brun, that's uh, Czechoslovakia and Moravia. This, this picture probably was taken around 41. And uh, my sister's name is Penina, she's in Israel, and my brother is here on Long Island. What's his name? His name is Sam. This picture is of two of my sisters. The one to the right is my younger sister, Elsie, and then I'm in the middle. And the one to the left is the one older than I, her name is Olga. This picture was taken in Liberec, Reichenberg. It should have been taken around uh, 1945, the end of 1945. Who's in this picture? This picture is of my, me, while well, I still had my red hair. Uh, it was taken probably for the passport where before I came to America. That would have been at the uh, sometimes in 1946. This is tape six. Today is May 21st, 1996, and our survivor is Walter Berger. Well, in this picture, that's my, the first picture when I came to the States, and that probably was taken in 1946, the end of 1946, or the very beginning of 1947. That's what I look like then. Could you tell us about this? Yes, this is a picture taken at uh, uh, one of the uh, simchas, one of the affairs that we had in the family. And uh, individually, if we want to start from the left, because I see you got it on the left, is my sister Gloria Gizi. Next to her is my sister that lives in Israel, Panina. And there I'm standing in the background. Next to me is my dear wife. She looks beautiful. Her name? And she is holding a Margie. And she is holding on to her sister in law, Inge, Inge Berger, my brother's wife. Next to my wife is Rose, my older sister. Next to her is my younger sister, 
And Bega heard my, my brother-in-law, Shlomo Smith, that's Petey's husband from Jerusalem. And at the end of my brother, Sam. And that picture was taken at one time when they visited here. Uh, the year, I don't know. Who was in this photograph? Yes, this photograph was uh, the picture of my younger daughter, our younger daughter, and her family. As you see to the left is me. Next to that is my middle, uh, her, my, the second grandson of my younger daughter, uh, Mayor, Mayor Elimelech. And next to him is his father, Benny Lipschitz. And that little blonde is my granddaughter, Batsheva Nahoma. And next to him is my beautiful daughter, Hedy, the mother of those kids. Next to her is her son, Nathaniel Moshe. And below them is my youngest one, Refur Yudaria, Raf, which we call him Rafi. And at the end is my lovely wife, Margie. And this picture was taken probably uh, in two years in, in 1994 at the Bar Mitzvah. That's a picture of my beautiful family. It was taken at the Bar Mitzvah, I believe, of my uh, oldest grandson. And uh, in the picture, the one in the red, that my, my oldest daughter, youngest daughter, Naomi, Naomi Ann, that's in Yiddish, is Nitzana Chaya, and she's right now in Israel, and Achim Gold. And the little fella is uh, my grandson, Rafi. Next to the one in red, next to Naomi, is me, without the glasses, I have to look twice. And I'm holding on to my dear wife, Margie. And beneath her is Doris, now known as Doris Kanovich. And the big fella there with the beard is Dr. Jonathan Kanovich. Next to him is the mitzvah boy, Nathaniel Moshe Lipschitz. And underneath him is his sister, his little sister, my little Batsheva. And with the head, that's my daughter, Hedy, the mother of the Bar Mitzvah. And back of her is Benny Lipschitz, my son-in-law. And next to him is my oldest granddaughter, Risa Allen. And next standing to her is my other granddaughter, Erica, Erica Lynn. And sitting down is... Uh, is Mayor Elimela. That's the brother to the Bar Mitzvah or next, sitting next to his mother. And that picture was taken in 93. This picture is of a... When we went to Israel, we brought a safer there to Gush... Gush Katif. That's near the Gaza Strip. And to the left is the couple, uh, Yitzchak and his wife, uh, Yitzchak Solomon and his wife, who's a landsman of mine. He was instrumental, he lives in Petach Tikva, and he was here, and has his son is there on that Moshav, Gush Katif, and they have only one Sefer Torah. They have two, one of the puzzle one, and one of the borrowed one. So when we went to Israel in uh, last year, in 1995, we took along a Sefer to them. The the mentala is that it was given by our shul. And next to me, standing in the back of my, my uh, brother-in-law, Shlomo Smith, who lives in Jerusalem, and my dear wife. Next to her is Naomi. She's uh, that's the, my granddaughter that's right now studying there. And at the end is my sister, Piri, Panina uh, Smith. And that was, as I said, taken on, in Gush Katif. Uh, it's a small town, and they, they very much appreciated the gift what they got. This is a picture of my friend 
George Danenberg, what I had mentioned in the interview, he, he, I owe my life to him, and he owes his life to me. We were inseparable during the most of the, practically the entire time that I was in forced labor. He is from Budapest, but we have gotten along greatly, and uh, we finally met after uh, 1948 in July. That is close to fair. that's 48 years since we haven't seen one another. The the enjoyment, the pleasure that we arrived and met his lovely his wife, his lovely uh, wife Edith, and a daughter, an amazing a daughter with the same name as mine. His wife was the same age as mine. And uh, we were both happy to meet, and we are in constant touch. We are in touch. We hope someday to retrace the places that we've been to. He remembers much more than I do. And uh, one of my fond things is that I found him. And I'm uh, really glad that he's doing well. He's in the photography business in uh, Thousand Toes, California. Yes, I'd like to introduce my family. We will start with my little blonde, pr uh, blonde princess, Batsheva. Batsheva, would you wave and so they know who, they, who it is? And, uh, and back of me is my, our daughter, daughters. And uh, she came here, she lives in uh, Westchester, but came down here to be with us this evening. Next to her is the tall fella, Natara Moshe, <laughs> who, uh, I hope he didn't skip school, but uh, this is our big grandson, that's Hedy's son. That, that means that he's standing next to his mother, Hedy, Hedy Lipschitz. Was here from Oceanside, that's where they live. And to my left is my uh, bride of 48 some odd years, Margie. And on her lap is the, our big boy, Rafi, the four year Daria. He's a good boy and he goes to a house in school, same where his sister goes to. We wanted to, on, on behalf of the Konovich family, and I'm sure the Lipschitz family as well, um, Jonathan, Risa, Eric, and Naomi, my children who couldn't be here today, um, thank Mommy and Daddy very much for doing this tape. And, um, and we look forward to watching it and sharing their experiences um, with them. Uh, I'm sure my parents uh, discussed their trip to Eastern Europe with Hetty and myself and my eldest daughter, Risa, and that was, um, that was a, a very moving, a wonderful experience for us and something that we learned a great deal from. And I know how difficult making uh, this tape for the foundation and discussing things with us are for my parents, both my mother and my father. Uh, I'm particularly proud of my mother for doing this since it, it it has always been so difficult for her to speak about her experiences and to share with us her, what her life was like since um, one of the reasons I feel is because she was so young. And um, thank you very much for, for me, for my husband, for my children, God willing, my grandchildren, and for all generations to come. I would just like to add that on behalf of my husband, Ben, who can't be here, and Natanel's next younger brother, Mayor, who also can't be here, um, that this is a fantastic project um, in that we will always have this and our children will always know who their grandparents are, where they came from, what made them the people they are, and therefore how that affected me and therefore the raising of my children. Um, it's a terrific undertaking, and my sister and I, as Dara said, really do appreciate that you did this. 
I thank you people for spending a whole day with us. It was a great cause. I hope for the world, if it's going to be shown for any place, and for my children and for my grandchildren. Well, I'd just like to say that I think this is a uh, wonderful opportunity for those uh, people who did live through the terrible experience of the Holocaust. They have a chance to share those experiences for everyone around the world to know about it and for us in the family to learn what happened in that terrible time for the Jewish people uh, more than we had known from before. Well, I, uh, I can only be grateful to my daughters that are here. And one thing that makes me very proud of them, that they get out of their way to be together with us whenever they can, to understand their mother or what she went through and reasons for things that are being the way they are. And I am grateful for the way they raise their children and the way they, my, our parents would have been proud of them, that they all go in the same, follow the same footsteps, which I mean an orthodoxy. And it is a sacrifice for them to be here today. And it's just that the girls and Mayor Ellie cannot be here. He went on an outing. He graduated from high school. From junior high. Junior high. And they went to a trip to Washington. So this is the reason he couldn't be. The, the girls, to, they are visiting the Holocaust <laughs> Museum while they're there, naturally. And uh, Naomi, that's in Israel, cannot be here. The other two girls, Risa and Eric, uh, are working and they couldn't get away. So I'm grateful to their mothers that they made it here. And I'm grateful to you people, to the organization, that you gave us this opportunity to say to our children and to people who will be interested, whether it's our landslide, whether it's people that have been exactly those places that they will be able to identify and see what we went through. So again, many a thanks thank you. to both of you. You were both wonderful.